So Jerry, I, you know one thing I was fascinated with, but I've watched you for a long time. To put some age perspective, we are 10 years apart, so it's not that big of a deal. So when I say I watch you when I was younger, I've kind of been obsessed with Wall Street since I was, I kind of got obsessed with it when I was like 11, and you were 21, you were going to Columbia, and um, I, I don't know where I first saw you, but I started seeing you, what, was it 20 years ago plus, Where because... You were in Smart Mag Smart Money magazine, right? Weren't you? That's right. That's yeah. Um, so after Columbia, which was like a, a mid-career uh, interregnum learning opportunity in the business school, where I met my husband, by the way. By the way, uh, by the way, you went to uh, school the same school. I'm being a smart ass for a second. You went to the same school that Warren Buffett did. Warren Buffett and I have so much in common. Not. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So you know how it is. Journalists like journalists sometimes don't know a lot about how this stuff works. And so going to business school was the real eye opener in terms of the economy and, you know, learning that accounting is really just storytelling more than anything else. Right. And, um, all learning all of that kind of stuff. And then I, ran around and worked a bunch of different places and ended up at Smart Money Magazine where I really started focusing on personal finance and doing those stories, which was a ton of fun and I really loved that. And then and then, how did you end up at... Is, so where, I'm, where I get confused with yourself is that you were at CNN and then you went to Fox. I, it, that, how do you do that? I guess, so, I guess the argument is Lou Dobbs was at CNN and he went to Fox, right? So what the heck? Um, so I was at, uh, I was at Smart Money Magazine and I was doing TV sort of everywhere, you know, just as a guest, right? You know how that works. Right. And, um, CNN was starting the financial network and they called me and decided they wanted to hire me. And the story of like my interview there is ridiculous because I had no idea what I was doing because I had no background in TV, right? My entire background was as a journalist and personal finance and all of that. So they bring me in, they have me read prompter and I hear a voice in my ear. I would read the prompter, you know, uh, two people killed in a car accident, blah, blah, blah. And the voice in my head would say bigger. So I would speak louder. This went on for two or three times and they still hired me shockingly. Mm -hmm. And then the financial network turned into what went away was, KO'd and they took the little show I was doing and put it on Saturday mornings on regular old fashioned CNN. And I did that for a while. And then I sort of wanted to do more. And you start to realize that CNN wasn't really about business news or finance and that I could really specialize. And so I interviewed at Fox. And if you'll give me the chance to tell that story, I think you'll enjoy it. I'd love to hear the story. So here's the story. So, uh, I had to kind of talk my agent into getting me an interview at Fox for Fox Business because he was like, oh, you should, you know, see, see it in, stay at CNN, you know, like he wanted me to stay at CNN. But I wanted to interview at Fox Business because I felt like I could have a real impact. So they line up this interview for me with Roger Ailes, right? And so I leave CNN, which at the time was at Columbus Circle, if you'll remember, and I'm in full makeup, hair, high heels, a dress. I get in a cab. I get about two-thirds of the way there. It's not that far to the 6th Avenue location. And I am so nervous that I get out of the cab to walk the last six blocks. So I'm walking down uh, 6th Avenue, and all of a sudden I feel a splat on my forehead. A pigeon has just pooped. I, this is oh, true, my on my forehead ahead of what is, you know, like the biggest interview of my entire career, right? And I flip out. I completely freak out. I continue walking towards the interview, and suddenly across the street I see a Gap store, which exists there to this day. 
I run in, I ask for the bathroom, I go back to the bathroom, I look in the mirror, and I just burst out laughing. Because, I mean, it's pretty funny, right? Right, I mean, it's you know. funny. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> people have to do that. So I take toilet paper and I remove the poop, throw it in the john, walk across the street, and walk into Ale's office, and I tell him the story. Because, I mean, there's a big hole in my makeup, right? Right. I'm orange except for that one circle on my forehead. And I told him what happened. He laughed and he hired me. <laughs> I heard I heard I heard Roger was um a really great guy to work for. Put all the controversial stuff aside that's irrelevant now he's passed away. Um but what was it like working at Fox? I mean for, for Roger when he was around. Sorry, I know you're still well, there. So, you know, I was at the business. I've, I've been at the business network. So, I mean, ultimately, most of my interaction was, you know, ultimately not that much with Roger. It was with the people who ran Fox Business. So that was, you know, that was different. But but the thing about Fox that was so attractive for me, and really how I ended up going there, was that it's really like being – on, even today on a team like a it, it's like it's like it's like a family rather than a corporation mm. you know got it i got you know shep smith the day i landed i had a long email from him about you know i've watched your stuff for a long time really love you want you on the show you know the audio text welcome jerry we're so glad to have people were just lovely and you know, it's it still has that sensibility, that family thing about it. Amazingly, so it's a culture in in house that really keeps people there. I think. So Maria was at um, she CNBC. she was at CNBC and she came like really popular. So when did you start working with her? Because I thought I've, I think haven't I seen you guys together before? I'm just I'm I I, I feel like I've seen you so many places. That, like to me, like you, Terry, and a few others are like I've seen you guys so many different places, or at least on so many different shows, or you're hosting something or on someone else's show. It's confusing to me, like how how long you've worked with her. So, what was the timeline when she left CNBC for you to be? Were you already at Fox? I was already at Fox Business when she came. When she joined, okay. And um, I have been on her show many times. I've, I've seen you a ton. She is lovely and unbelievably, unbelievably generous with the people that she works with. I have to tell you, um, she's just very warm. You know, like a lot of television is cold. You know, it's just like, just the facts, man, boom. But she is really a lovely person. So I saw, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I saw your um, your your five years cancer-free uh the website, I watch you on Twitter and some of your stuff. I'm just curious. If, I don't know how much you would want to talk about it, but um, when you kind when you found out you had it, like I just wondered, like it that like what happens to you after you find like you have it. Like I always fear, like you know, and I talk to people who because I've been on, doing, done a lot of healthcare investing and watch people recover from that. I I, I founded a company called Alzheimer Neuro which just went public on the NASDAQ two months ago I saw uh, this. for a vaccine or treatment for Alzheimer's and go baby go. Yeah. Go baby go. Right. But, but what it was fascinating to me was it looked like you were sharing what was happening and you're sharing with your audience it looked like Fox was supportive, but I was curious yeah. as to what uh, happened when you found out about it and then how you rallied. Cause it looked like you rallied pretty well. Well, so yes, Fox was very supportive, unbelievably patient with me. Let me tell you, I get calls at home when I was in treatment and they'd say, not when are you coming back, but how are you doing? And can we give you anything? Do you need anything like that? Wow. Which helps you get better. Sure. You know, but I have to say one of the big issues for me is that I was in denial for so long, like. I had the interview with, you know, the people at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I talked to the woman who was going to do the mastectomy. I, I you know, I was, I, I was there, I was present, but there was some part of my brain that was not fully, could not fully grasp the fact that I had cancer. 
I mean, this sounds inane, but it's totally true. It wasn't really, I mean, I went through, you know, the surgery. It wasn't until I was deep into chemo that I realized that I really embraced the idea that I was in treatment, that it was super serious, and that I had to get on board with it and do everything I could to pull the wagon forward, if you know what I mean. So I guess it was like, uh, I was doing the Red Devil, if you know that chemo, which is really is that awful. Is that F5U? Is that F5U? No, no, it's not. Is it worse than F5U? I don't know. Well, when know. you ever read the bag of F5U, it basically says, don't let it touch your skin, and they're putting it in your body. <laughs> so I'm they're like, going to inject it in your body. Yeah, they're going to put it in your okay. body, but don't let it touch your skin. I'm like, uh, because I had a friend who had who, who cancer right here on her bone, and She's like, yeah, the bag says don't put it on your skin, but they're going to inject it in me. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's terrible. Well, this is corrosive in the extreme, and all of my veins were collapsing. And one day they couldn't get one of my veins to hold up under, uh, under you know, pressure. the pressure right. of this. And, and so I was so anxious you know, my shoulders were at my ears, my hands were clenched, my fists were clenched. And, you know, in that moment, it finally came to me, look, this can either be the best day of your life and treatment or the worst. And it's really up to you. You have to help. Mm -hmm. You can't just like getting upset and that's it is, is not enough. When so it's called de deoxyrub. I can't even say it. D-O-X-O-R-U-B-I-C-I-N is the name of the actual chemo yeah red and devil. it's really tough on your body right so right. after that i kind of i kind of got into it i don't know how to say it otherwise i mean literally before that point i would go into a waiting room and i would look at the other people in the room and i would think wow these people look really sick not knowing or thinking that i was one of them <laughs> is that not crazy that's crazy did you uh did you how long did you have to get that treatment that chemo treatment so that was uh, four months. It was uh, it was two different kinds of chemo. Taxol was the other one. You know, and it's you know all the strategies like how to keep your nails from falling off and right. all that nonsense. Um, and new, then Nupagen probably. Nope. It, no Nupagen. No. Wow. Because that that whole the destruction of red blood or of white blood cells, the destruction of bringing your immune system down. Uh, it seems like the, the concept of effectively torching you from inside, you know, and then the idea you have to rebuild it, I guess it makes you stronger. I, I, I hope that never happens to me or my wife. But well, I was taking shots at the time. Oh, you were. But the name was slightly different than what you're saying. Well, it usually helps you rebuild some of your blood right. cells, right? And I, th and, and I think Nupagen may actually be generic by now. Um, but my sister-in-law died from breast cancer oh, no. and she wouldn't get the treatment. And I'll, I want to say something to you. And this is why I was so excited about this interview is that my wife and I, she gets a mammogram every year because of her sister. She's 52 now. I ignore it because I just say it's going to be a good result. And every time she gets the test, it's come back negative, right? So she gets a mammogram. She's fine every single year. They tell her. Um, they say to her, oh, you can get it in five years now. And I'm like, no, you're getting it every year. This is nonsense. I, this is such poor health care uh, advice for someone who knows that I think her sister had, they call it, is it triple negative? Is that? Is oh, that, yeah. Yeah. And, but she wouldn't get That's treatment. Her, her, her sister said, I'm going to do it the macrobiotic way and I'm going to go get the same as Steve Jobs, where he had cancer, and he, he said, I'm just going to eat my way out of the cancer. I'm going to eat, like, you know, berries and twigs, and it's all going to be better. Oh. And I and I, and I I so I so was kind of hoping right now, because I've told my wife, I said, I swear to you, you cannot be like your sister. If something happens to you, you got to treat it, treat it. And I know my wife's going to watch this. And I know other people who watch it. I have a – listen, I don't have the audience you do, but I do have a decent-sized audience in, in the podcast world, nothing like you do, but – your message to someone who gets breast cancer, uh, whatever form it is, I assume would be the following. What would it be that they should do right away and adopt an attitude right away 
of because I just was mortified to watch my sister in law die from it at forty eight so years tragic. old. Right, really sad. That's so tragic. Re- that just makes my heart hurt. And she never got treatment. I I just. I can't. I personally can't imagine ever doing that. Right. But look, in terms of testing, first of all, testing. Let's start there because mm. that is the essential first step. If you don't test, you don't know. You end up with stage three, stage four. It gets bad. Right. <clears throat> I was tested six months before my nipple inverted. Okay. So no, we're not waiting five years. Right. We're doing it every year, every right. year, and. It would be interesting to know if your sister-in-law's cancer was genetic or not. Not all, not much of it actually is uh-huh. if you look at the science. So, uh, listen, you don't want to mess around with this. Sure, this is not. This isn't like having an extreme cold. Okay, this this is something you don't want to mess around with. You have to get treatment. And despite the fact that it took me a long time to lock into the, you know, into like what was, I couldn't embrace the diagnosis. I still did everything my doctors told me. I still made sure I got the treatment. I got the treatment fast. Uh, I just, so now at Fox and with people, you know, in my universe, I'm always advocating for, let's get it tested. Let's get it tested. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't know anything until you know something, right? So getting all nervous about the test is a waste of time. Just go do it. And if something comes back, then we deal with it. Then you can get upset, but not before that. Did you go down the avenue at all, like I can do some sort of natural remedy, or was that just something? No. That, no. No. That's why we have modern medicine. Right. Okay. All right. You said it. I wanted you to say it because I, I, I can't put myself in your shoes. I've never had that happen but i tell people all the time friends family females i know you get it done if something happens get the treatment if you want to put in diet and modern medicine fine yeah. but don't yeah. do don't just choose just to do the diet it's it's um it's uh um, i mean the question is now what do i do to keep myself in a good place physically right and so you know there it's diet there it's you know very little alcohol there. It's reducing sugar. You know, like you can do all of that now, but but when you're faced with a diagnosis, get serious, pony up. It's time to to get the work done. What's amazing about you is I see you right now. We're on camera. This is a little podcast. You look like you're in your early forties. I do, love it. You. Doesn't seem I like love you. no, but I, I'm being serious. <laughs> I'm being serious. You're 62. You went through right. through 63. chemo, which really drags it out of you. Do you recall, like, did it drag you out of you and you kind of had to recover from it? Or did you feel like you looked your, like yourself the whole time? No. I mean, well, first of all, uh, because my cancer was estrogen-based, I have to take a drug that, you know, limits my the estrogen in my body, depresses it dramatically. So that ages you. You feel the results in your, in your uh, joints. Um, mm. It really takes a toll. So you really have to work hard at, you know, trying to, to make yourself healthy. So, yeah, I mean, the irony is I felt I thought that I looked okay during treatment, but that's because you have a ton of inflammation in your face, right? Right. And, and you know, it does take a toll on your body and you've really got to, you know, in, intelligently push back against that. I was just curious. From an estrogen, because pers- pers- what would it be replaced with then? Hmm. See, I know enough about well, healthcare to be dangerous, so I shouldn't. Uh... Well, um, I can only talk from my personal point of view. Sure. Right. Um, restricting estrogen reduced uh, it reduces your muscle. Sure. Right. You have less muscle tone. You got to work to try to get the muscles back. Right. Now I'm pre-osteoporosis, right? Right. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, your joint, I mean, the first thing I noticed was the joints were just killing me, right? Right. I mean, I had a real hard time with that. But over time, your body kind of figures out a way to make it work. Yeah. You know, I wonder if, that's, I wonder if that's why people who are reducing estrogen, they have joint pain. I wonder if that inflammation... That reducing uh, jo- that joint pain is why people use cannabis to 
reduce yeah. the amount of pain in the joints. I mean, I guess I presume that would be a natural. I, I, I okay. I I, uh, I know enough about that. To I be didn't dangerous. do that, but I I think people do. No, I get your point. I know. I got that. Um, I wanted to change subject for a second because you wrote a couple books, and I wonder if you're going to write any more. I know you wrote one on real estate. What's happening with your writing career? Are you not writing anymore, or are you writing now? So I okay. I'm just going to be super honest about this. I just pitched a great book idea, and no one's picked up on it. You want to hear about it? Yeah, tell me. Okay. So uh, the idea. I want. Hold on a second. Hold on. Oh, if if you tell me the story, and I like it. Is there a possibility we could publish it together? Because that's okay. Go ahead. I'm just kidding around. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I love the idea of doing it. I love the idea of publishing stuff. And Willie, as you know, who heads my media group, um, has been in in Wall on Hollywood for so long that he's made things possible for me that I never were able to do. Very cool. Yeah. Anyways, continue. I'm sorry. So, um, so coming out of COVID, I sort of felt like I don't. You know, since breast cancer, I'd always been sort of a consigliere as sort of a, you know, a, an advisor for young women, right, at, at the network. And I sort of felt like they were all freaking out and because of COVID. You know, one of my producers uh, had started having panic attacks. Uh, a member of my family, a young woman, had started having panic attacks. There was a lot going on with them. For sure. So I wanted to do something very at a boy or at a girl um, to kind of encourage them. And the idea I came up with was to showcase young women in history who had changed the country against what would appear to be insurmountable odds, right? So nice. women who had done amazing things in worlds that were very difficult, just inspiration, what they call inspo on the gram, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I came up with, you know, there was a young woman who was – in the middle of protecting Abraham Lincoln in the first attack on him, the first attack on his life, right before he was inaugurated. She um, worked as a, a private investigator and helped keep him safe through that. There was a woman in Richmond who worked for the Union. I mean, that was the capital of the Confederacy during the Civil War. She ran spies and gave the information to, you know, union generals at the time. And when the war ended and Richmond was falling, her neighbors came out yelling at her in her yard. And she said, you wait. She said, General Grant is coming to my house and I'm going to give him all of your names. And she planted a big union flag in her front yard. So I, I just, I wanted to tell stories about women who had done incredible things. And I found a ton of spies. I mean, like women are great spies because nobody ever thinks they're going to do that. Nobody, nobody ever thinks that. Some of the best spies, that. right. Some of the best. What, uh, what's, um, what's the famous, is it Coco Chanel, right? She was a spy at one time, wasn't she? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about that is what, what, you, I'm just curious. I have no idea. What kind of advances do they give someone like yourself? Less and less these days, unless you are, uh, unless you were O'Reilly or unless you are one of these big writers, um, mm. it's not what it used to be. Right. And, uh, it's a lot less. Got it. Well, if, if, if I'm the last guy around, maybe you'll pitch it to me. I love it. I, I'm not I, joking. I, I, I know, but I think she thinks I'm I joking. I like you. You seem like a very nice person to me. I think she thinks I'm joking around. It, yours would be great. I'd love it for sure. Hey, I wanted to talk to you because I know you wrote a book on real estate. A lot right. of syndication taking place, like the Grant Cardones of the world, bringing in money, getting people to buy multifamily housing. Um, I wondered what you thought about that sort of passive income uh, syndication market. Like, Because you wrote a book about it. Uh, I know this is something you spent some time on, educating people. A lot of syndication taking place. I wonder what your thoughts were. I'm not sure I have the, the most nuanced perspective on it now because I'm not covering it like I was. Um, I'm kind of at a distance. Um, today's market feels a little like, you know, the previous run up, right? The differences are that people have so much capital in their pockets right now. There's right. so much loose change that people are trying to put to work. 
And I think that we've all kind of misunderstood. Remember when people used to say, oh, they're going to be all these retirees, they're going to retire, it's going to be terrible, terrible for the economy. They did. They drained the economy. They take the money out of the system. Richard Dent Maybe kind of not. thing. Yeah. Maybe not. They're out there. They're buying second homes. They're buying third homes. Like, Maybe it ain't so bad. Maybe it's good to have those people with some cash in their pockets and doing stuff. Hmm. I think, you know, as usual, people think things are going to be horrible and they turn out to be better than you expected. You know, this actually brings up something that I'm going to go off. Like, I know this is not exactly script, but there is a little bit of script here, but I'm going to go way off script for a second. Okay. I, I have, because it sounds like you do a lot of research, especially for what you were just pitching. I have this thesis that every generation thinks it's terrible, right? And yeah. I wonder if you think the same thing. Like, yes. I saw this headline, like, this town is a run amok because of all the people tying up their horses, and there's manure <laughs> right in the middle of the, of the, the, the city walk where the dirt is, and th this is all going to hell in a handbasket. And then I see, uh, you know, in the 1950s, it was like, there's going to be nuclear war, build a, build a thing underneath, and then there's the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then... JFK is shot and every generation and we had a world war where people like millions of people died their atomic bombs were used and then you get this generation now the millennial generation where they're like if I wasn't alive and I didn't see it didn't happen um they're rewriting history they're canceling people they're doing all kinds of terrible stuff Abraham Lincoln can't be on the name of a school in California I know it's unbelievable and so I wondered do you experience the same thing I am? I do a little bit of research, not like you, but like when they all say this is like, this is the typical thing, you know, I'm Donald Trump or who, forget Donald Trump, let's not use him. Uh, this is the most important election we're ever going to have. This could be the thing that changes everything. Right. <laughs> I'm wondering, you've seen this and you've studied history here. Am I wrong to think that every generation thinks it's the end of the world for them? I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, consider, and I brought this up earlier, like the Civil War era. Meanwhile, in New York, there's technology run amok. All of the world is changing. Things are getting better. Chicago, trains going, you know, rails being built across the country. So, yeah, everybody thinks life is terrible and how, how bad is it? People think that now. Hello, we cured covid with a vaccine nobody had ever seen before. Right. Technology brand new. Right. We fixed that. How many movies have you watched where there's some runaway disease that everybody dies of? Sure. We could, that could have been us. Sure. Was it us? No, it was not. I, I know I was actually watching about what's happening with biotechnology and the and now that we we can cure literally sickle cell anemia which was killing the African-American population. Now we have a cure right. for it. Now, unfortunately, it's a million dollars a treatment, but we can cure it, right? And this is all because of of, of what they call that's CRISPR, amazing. a CRISPR technology, amazing stuff yeah. that's happening. I'm an investor, and I won't talk about the company I'm invested in, but I'm an investor in a, a company that has late-stage treatments for life extension for breast cancer when you're kind of at level three and it's really bad. And they're out of Canada, and now they're getting great results and shrinking tumors and things that have all really spread metastasized. Um, and so you can see this sort of massive advancement, but yet I wake up to it's the end of the world all the time and we're not going to be okay. And, and every, you know, you see a, like a, an Al Gore say 25 years ago, 11 years from now we're going to be gone or this is all going to be melted. And I'm, I'm, I, I presume other people see the same thing, but you being in the media, you've heard this your whole life, right? You've been writing about it and hearing that, this time well, it's, it's, it's different? So I think sometimes this is a problem for me as a journalist because I'm generally pretty optimistic. You know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> like I'll be like, that sounds like a good idea. I think, you know, like somebody comes to me and they want to talk about some kind of innovation or some idea. And, I, and I'm like upbeat, optimistic. I'm not like, well, that could never possibly. I mean, that's just not my personality. So at the end of the day, I might not be the best journalist on the planet because I don't have that kind of negative, let's find the one thing about this that might put it at risk. You know what I mean? Sure. Jerry, is there anything you want to talk about before I, before I ask my last two questions? I wanted to talk about breast cancer. 
and I'm glad you wanted to talk about it because I was always always nervous with whether people oh, yeah. want. No, no, no. I mean, so I mean, the secret of that is when I first got diagnosed, uh, I went to the people at Komen. Um, Nancy Brinker was in the green room that week. Wow. And I'd just gotten diagnosed, and I went to her and said, "As soon as I get through treatment, I'm coming to you and I'm working for you." Wow. And and she said, "Do it, baby." And I, we, you know, me and Fox, we raised a ton of dough for them. Wow. Uh, and the Fox audience, oh my Lord, those people were so nice to me. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable the support I got. Well, that, that kind of leads me to my last two questions. And the last one is a little bit more difficult, uh, just in the sense that obviously it's going to take a little of what your thoughts are on the world, but um, kind of what's, what is happening for you now and what's next? I know you just said, you were you were working on a, a book, but what's what are you doing at Fox now? What do you want to do? What's what's happening with you right now? So I doing a lot of reporting out in the field, having a good time out in the field. Just wrapped a three day uh, piece, uh, uh, you know, American road trip. We went to the Statue of Liberty. We went to the Baseball Hall of Fame. We went to. Uh, the Amer the American the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. If you haven't been there, go. It's very cool. Um, I'm just enjoying some like basic. Can you hear my dog in the background? Rufus. <laughs> and I'm p spending a lot of time with my dog. I I'm just doing some basic reporting and enjoying it, and looking forward to getting back into the office and seeing everybody. I, I mean, I've been out for a long time, about 18 months. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, you know, sort of, I feel like it's been this weird interrogum where I've been in touch with no one, you know, so I'm looking forward to that. I wanted to cover one thing with you. I, I don't know if, if Willie shared with you. Um, so in watching your story about how you survived cancer and fought with it, my father has Alzheimer's. He's in an Alzheimer's home now doesn't remember who I am. My mother-in-law died from Alzheimer's. My grandparents died from Alzheimer's. Uh, wow. My father's relative, my father's brothers and sisters are all getting it or, or, or have it in various stages. His sister is very far along. She's in a home with him, actually, a couple doors down. Um, hopefully someday I can come to you and say, hey, Jerry, we got great information on this because we actually got approval to go into patients for the first time with a new treatment uh, this September, and we have a vaccine we think is going to be approved to go into patients in December. So I want to keep you abreast of that. Um, but I want to say to you that this leads into my next question, which is that I'm an entrepreneur. I've had failures and successes. I got $1,400 from my grandfather when I started my business 30-something uh, years ago, and I named the company after my grandfather. Do you believe in the American dream of still being alive? And I'll, before I before you answer that, and if you do believe it's alive, do you think it's under attack? Because to me, and I, I wonder, I don't want to be that guy who says it's different this time because I just told you before it happened to everybody, right? And I wondered, like, in the seventies when there was this gas problem and embargoes and all the issues we had, and and uh, Ronald Reagan getting shot, there was always this sense of that. Oh my God, this is really bad. But for me, it seems like the American dream's under attack. I'm curious as to what you think about it. You report on this stuff every day. You report on America every day. I don't think anyone has a better perspective than you. I'm curious. Well, you're always way, you're way kind. But I absolutely believe in the American dream. Amen and amen, right? I mean, come on now. I'm a little girl from Western North Carolina uh, whose uh, grandparents and great-grandparents grew tobacco my uh, great grandfather was uh, a Baptist minister who, uh, you know, would preach for corn to, to, you know, I mean, look, it exists, it is real, and it is real today. It is real today. Is it under assault? Yeah, it's always under assault. In every generation, there are threats to it. But there's a pushback because it's hard to resist the allure of this, right? If you come, you work hard, You there are benefits, you will move ahead. You can do better. And I definitely believe in it. 
I think there are some serious worries and concerns right now. And I think a lot of it has to do with this, you know, the millennial generation and this idea that we have to shut down debate in this country and that everybody has to sing from the same prayer book and, you know, nobody can have a thought on their own and everything, you know, is judged on the basis of whether it threatens somebody. I think people have lost their minds. Um, and I think part of it actually is, is a result of what happened during COVID. People just kind of got crazy, but it's a real thing and people really benefit. There wouldn't be a stock market without it. Right. Right. Optimism is what keeps that thing going. Right. People believe in the future. They don't necessarily believe what journalists write every day. Right. Mm -hmm. They believe, no, it'll probably get better. The idea, the single idea that companies can grow earnings ad infinitum on this kind of trajectory higher and higher forever is an incredible testament to the optimism of this country, right? Right. So uh, do I believe in it? Yes, I do. That's, I can't be another way. That's the thing. I, I, that's how it is for me. I just tend to be more upbeat. I, I, why, how do you go forward if, if you don't think it can get better. Now, there are threats and you got to work against them. Yes, yes, yes. But if you think it's impossible for that to happen, then there's no reason to get up in the morning. I'm sorry. Uh, Jerry, I, I, I will tell you, I, I feel like it's probably not true. I'm 52 years old. I started my career at a firm called Dean Witter. We probably don't even remember oh, yeah. that. I yeah. feel like I've read you my whole career. It may not be the case. Um, I think it's just because you've been everywhere, or at least I, I'm a guy who consumes the stuff you put out there, right? Sees the shows you do, sees you on Fox. I saw you on CNN. I know Charles Payne. I actually, uh, I knew, yeah. believe it or not, Charles used to sell something called Jag Notes like 30 years ago when I was a broker at Dean Witter. Jag True story. Notes. Jag Notes. Oh my God. Do you remember them? Yes. Uh, I'm dating myself. Anyways, Jerry, I was thrilled that you were going to be on the show. I'm super excited to watch you, continue to watch you. I know that all the people that follow me will be thrilled that you're on here. I, I think uh, I think Jerry's a, a, a rock star on this show. Ah, oh, you are awesome. I, I appreciate you it, Jerry. Jerry, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate your time. Um, that was fun for me. No, I'm not to you, but...